everyone. Welcome to episode 170 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. We're sitting across from each other in Book Cougars headquarters. Yeah, back together again, recording. It's so nice to be in the same space, talking books. It is. I mean, technology's grand, but being together is even more grand. It so. is, indeed. And, and this is another 10th episode and for those of you who are newer listeners, every 10th episode, we do a giveaway to be right. entered to win. You just have to be a newsletter subscriber. We try to keep things simple that way. And our newsletter goes out once a month, typically on the last day of the month. And in order to subscribe, just go to our website, bookcougars.com slash subscribe. And we'll put that in the show notes as well. The show notes are also available on bookcougars.com and it lists everything we talk about on each episode with links to books and activities and author homes and all sorts of things. So check it out. Yeah. And so this 10th episode thing started on our 10th episode because we were just like, wow, we've done 10 episodes. We need to celebrate. <laughs> 160 episodes later, here we are on our 170th episode. Yeah. Yeah. So would you like to share what books yeah. we're giving away this time? So we have two books to give away. One is called My Brilliant Life by Aaron Kim. This is translated by Chi Young Kim. It was originally published in Korean and was a bestseller in Korea and also became a movie there, a very popular movie blurbs from all sorts of authors talking about how good it is. And then we also have one from Soho Press, a book called Death on a Winter Stroll, a Mary Folger Nantucket Christmas Mystery by Francine Matthews. And this one sounds like a lot of fun. It has such a cool cover too. I love winter scenes. Yeah. If you become a newsletter subscriber by December 15th, you'll be automatically entered to win. If you're already a newsletter subscriber, just sit back and wait to find out if you've won. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a Patreon only giveaway of the displacements by Bruce Holsinger, and we will choose the winner of that on December 15th as well. Yes. So good luck, everyone. Yeah. And thank you for your patronage. Yeah, we appreciate you, all of you, and of our you. newsletter subscribers. Yes. And our listeners. Lots of thankfulness for all of you. Chris, what are you currently reading? I'm currently reading The Foulest Things, A Dominion Archives Mystery by Amy Tector. I'm loving it. It's such a fun mystery. I was looking for something archivey to read. And this is a book that Amy had sent to us. She sent us an advanced reader copy PDF version. So when I had a DNF recently... I was like, okay, I'm going to dig up that PDF and read it. Because I don't always like to read on my e-reader, but I was hankering for it. So really enjoying it so far. I'm just about 100 pages in, and the book is a little bit under 300 pages, I believe. So enjoying it. More to come on that one. That's great. And, and I should say that Amy is a archivist in real life. She's an archivist at the National Archives of Canada. I believe she's also a professor as well. Yeah, and she sent us an email and that got us looking at her website and everything. Really interesting person. So maybe I'll put a link to her website in the show notes under the link for the book too, so people can explore who she is. I'm reading a book by someone that most people know. I'm listening to it on audio, The Light We Carry by Michelle Obama. This is her new book. It's a follow-up to Becoming. It's not a to-be-continued of Becoming. They're very different books. This is more an essay form and her giving you stories that share her wisdom that she's gleaned from her years of being everything, you know, a daughter, a mother, a wife, the first lady. She shares some really fun behind the scenes stories that you would never know. Like the very first time she spoke at the Democratic National Convention, her brother Craig introduced her and then she walked out on stage and she thought he was going to whisper in her ear something really encouraging and instead he whispered, the teleprompter on the right is broken. <laughs> <laughs> so then she goes on to tell the whole story about keeping your shit together when things are seemingly unraveling that you counted on. Yeah. So. Oh my God. That is so funny. Yeah. So <laughs> it's really good. I'm enjoying it. I'm actually almost done and I will probably turn right back around and just start it again. That's cool. Yeah. I look forward to that one too. Yeah. Nice. 
Yes. So what have you just read? I have been doing all e-reading because I was traveling. So I finished up the book I talked about last time, Take What You Need by Idra Novi. This book was told from two separate points of view, Jean and Leah. Leah is a young woman who was the stepdaughter of Jean. Jean leaves Leah's father because he is violent and unpleasant and doesn't think through the fact that he might then make her become estranged from her stepdaughter. So the novel is really about both of those women dealing with the consequences of that, but also their lives as mothers slash stepmothers and being an artist. Jean is an artist who's living in her father's old home after he's passed away, and she builds these huge metal structures, and she puts words on them. It's just fascinating. I've never read anything like this book. Mm. If you are interested in art, if you're interested in Appalachia, this book takes place in Appalachia and how people survive in spite of difficult circumstances, this would be a book for you. I want to be very cagey about it because the reading of it was really special to me and I don't want to give any spoilers of any kind. This is the book that I talked about, the epigraph, that was Louise Bourgeois talking about how we sculpt ourselves. And that's really a theme of this book. It's the perfect epigraph for this book. So these two women going in and out of each other's lives and how their relationship is sculpted, how Jean uses actual physical sculpture to handle her emotions and communicate in the world. Oh, fascinating book. It sounds like it. Now, are these sculptures indoor or outdoor sculptures or variety? They're or- indoor, okay. which becomes a situation <laughs> because <laughs> they're quite large and quite heavy. And she's welding and using a lot of heavy equipment, which becomes part of the story as well. So, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so what I wrote down is the themes are Appalachia, familial estrangement, art as therapy, unexpected friendships, and mentorship, poverty. She covers a lot of bases. Motherhood, chosen family. I could go on and on. It's a beautiful book. I just loved it. Is it a long book? Or is it just very compact? No, it's not long. I would say it was around 300 pages. It definitely wasn't, you know, like a tome. Yeah. It read very fast for me. This book comes out on March 14th. Thank you to Viking and NetGalley for giving me an advance reader's copy. Put this one in your queue if any of those things are appealing to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I read a book. It's part of my research for a paper I'm writing, the Cicero riot that happened in 1951 that I knew nothing about until I was an adult. The title is No, N-O-E, No, The Cicero Riot Story. It's by H.M. Edwards. Edwards is the granddaughter and the daughter of two of the men who were involved in purchasing the apartment building. They're African-American men who purchased this apartment building in Cicero when it was considered a sundown town where African-American people were not allowed to live. They could work during the day, but they needed to be out by sundown. There was a lot of racial housing problems in Chicago at the time, and Cicero's right next to Chicago, and this apartment building was just blocks away. So when the first African-American renter tried to move in, a huge riot was started. And there are a lot of different reasons why. And the research I'm doing has really been fascinating on that. But Edwards wrote this to kind of clear her family name. Because instead of the white rioters who trashed the apartment, the personal belongings of the family, and also harmed other apartments and the building as a whole, there were arrests made during the riots, but none of those people were ever charged with anything. There were indictments, but all the white people were eventually cleared. And then indictments came down for the African-American people involved, believe it or not. And you read about these things in history books, but to read somebody's personal account of it, and she was very young and didn't know anything about it growing up. 
And so one of the aspects of this paper, because it's for my class that is on history, archives, and collective memory, and along with collective memory, there's collective forgetting. And how does that happen? And why does it happen? And just the different types of forgetting. So when she was growing up, she didn't know anything about it. But every now and then she'd hear something and she would ask an adult about it. And at one point, her grandmother, I believe it was, said, you don't need to know anything about that. That was for our generation. You just need to be living and succeeding and don't worry about it. So at a certain age, Edwards sneaks around in her dad's library and she finds a book by the white woman who used to own the apartment building, Camille de Rose, and it's the Camille de Rose story that was published in the 50s for her to get income because she had so many legal cases. And so Edwards read by flashlight underneath the blanket. That's what she does with this book, the Camille de Rose story, because she wants to know. And she was shocked by a lot of the things that she read in there and didn't believe them. And then over the years, since her parents died, her dad, she has had access to his papers to learn a bit more about what happened. And obviously she's done her own research and archives and newspapers and everything. So this is her memoir of her growing up and the people in her life and trying to clear their name. And along the way, there are details that I haven't read in other sources about things that happened. So it's an awful part of Cicero history, but it gave me, you know, a different perspective into it because I think she might be a little bit older than I am, but, you know, I didn't grow up knowing about it. It's just fascinating to me that families don't talk about things like this, whether they're perpetrators or victimized by a situation, yeah. you know, and it's just like all these family secrets and town secrets and the will to forget is so strong and just pretend things didn't happen. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's just about not understanding how to have the language for it. Or it's as you were saying, you know, it's like, that's gone now that's done. Let's not talk about it. We went through that so that you could have a better life mm -hmm. as if it's not going to affect the person, but things that aren't said, as we know, are the things that end up creating most of the damage or just the curiosity, if nothing else. Right because it's still there. It mm -hmm. still resides right. in the family DNA. Right. And yeah, and the community as a whole, you know, I mean, Cicero still has major racial problems. And this is a print on demand book, as far as I can tell, came out in 2011. She could have used a stronger editor because some things are confusing at the sentence level. But overall, it's a really compelling story. So again, that's and the no, N-O-E, no, is something that her grandmother used to say. No, N-O-E, no. And she's like, I don't know where the E comes from, but um, that's what Grammy used to say. So no, N-O-E, no. The Cicero Riot Story by H.M. Edwards. Very cool. I read a very short novel called Foster by Claire Keegan. Claire Keegan is getting well known in the States because her book, Small Things Like These, was a Booker nominee this year. This book was published in 2010. I read it on my e-reader. The title Foster comes from the notion of what happens to this young girl who's from a large Irish family where mom is about to give birth to another child and is very busy already with all of her other kids. And dad is kind of absent doing the dad thing and trying to earn a living and keep the family afloat. And so the book opens with dad just taking her to this rural farm this young girl and just dropping her off at this other family's house. Thus the idea of foster for the title. And at first it's kind of this eerie feeling like something's going to go wrong. There's a little bit of a weird feeling in the house and I'm not going to spoil what that weird feeling is, but ultimately she ends up being treated with incredible kindness and care from this husband and wife who are so thrilled to have her as part of the family. And then what happens if you go back to this other family and now you've experienced something that felt very different. So I've read a little bit about Claire Keegan. Apparently, even though her novel, like this is 89 pages, she takes a very long time to write them because it's a novella, but it's almost like poetry. Like you'd get the sense that she has chosen every word very carefully <laughs> beautiful novel i loved it just as much as i loved small things like these 
So again, it's called Foster by Claire Keegan. Well, drum roll, I finished Outlander by Diana Gobbledon. <laughs> wow, this was a big book. Over 800 pages. 850 in this little edition I read. Little edition, little mass market paperback that I ended up reading. Thanks, Mom, for letting me steal it from you. I ended up really, I think, enjoying it, I guess, overall. I think I really had a good time reading reviews of it on Goodreads <laughs> because I like things about it. I didn't like some things. So overall, I enjoyed the characters. I thought the time travel situation was really kind of fascinating. Some of the reviews that I've read really highlighted the problematic depictions of rape and sex and how it's borderline. Well, there's sadomasochism for sure, because women are raped by men. And then there's this whole storyline where one of the male characters is brutally raped and tortured by this other man. You know, and I saw that when I watched the TV adaptation. And I was just like, oh, you know, so when I'm reading the book, you know, we get past it and we're into something else. I'm like, oh, good. Like, it doesn't go into detail in the book about that. Maybe that was just something that they expanded on for the TV series. But then, of course, flashbacks and you get the whole story of what happened. So that was kind of challenging to read. But the reviews were a lot of fun. And I want to just point out one. And this is Goodreads. It was a woman named Holly. And a lot of people who have written bad reviews, like they're good reviews of bad books that are just hysterical. So I just wanted to read this beginning of Holly's. She says, a special note to those who say my review stopped them from reading this book. No, 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 read it. I actually reread the whole series last summer and enjoyed it immensely. Just read it for what it is. Ludicrous, well-written, humorous, delicious trash, <laughs> which made me laugh. And then um, I guess the title of her original review was How to Commit Adultery Without Being a Cheap Slutty Whore, a Q&A by Diana Gabaldon. <laughs> so, you know, her, her review is kind of like this fantasy. Um, and then she gives a plot summary that is just hysterical. I appreciate that because I think you can really enjoy something without having to put it on a pedestal and having a good time poking fun at some of the things that maybe don't have much of a leg to stand on, so to say. Did the historical part scratch your history buff itch? Not to be talking about itching with this book, but, you know, I'm curious because that is part of what people talk about loving about this whole series. Yeah, that was really fun. I mean, I don't know much about Scottish history at all. So I feel like I'm learning a little bit. That's really interesting. I've been thinking a lot about it because, you know, in Scotland, they had the clans what clan are you from? And in this book, the clans are still very much alive and well. And then in Ireland, it's the county, you know, what county are you from? Mm -hmm. So I'm so curious about both of them because they're both Celtic in origin. So I'm curious to learn more about the region itself from reading this book. It's kind of fun because Claire, the main character, she's married to a man named Frank, who's a history professor at the beginning of the book. And the time period she comes from is like 1945, 46, just after World War II. She loves her husband and she supports his interest in history and genealogy and everything. But, you know, she kind of rolls her eyes, too, at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of funny and relatable because I've been on both sides of the eye rolling. <laughs> I'm going to read on. I'm not going to read the next book right away, but I'm definitely going to read the whole series because, like I said, it's enjoyable, but some of the things are just a bit problematic, and it could be from the time period as well. I mean, these books, when did this one come out? 1991. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole notion of rape culture, Roxane Gay talks about that, like why do we live in a society with rape culture and... So when you read things in books, you know, in, from the early 90s, the depiction of that and the conversation around it is a lot different. But I also think that there is this whole notion of bodice rippers and what turns people on when they're reading and mm -hmm. that sometimes reading it is much different than experiencing it, right? So I have very mixed feelings about that. I definitely have very quick off button when it comes to reading rape scenes and things like that. But everybody has a different threshold. And sometimes maybe they're sexier than others, which is a weird thing to say about that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So I read it, people I did it. Diana Gabaldon Outlander, I look forward to 
reading more and continuing on with the TV series. I have the most current one to watch when the semester's over. So I'm just going to jump into the next thing I read, which was because of this, talking about the rape scenes and reading reviews. And Emily and I had a long car drive yesterday and we were talking about it. It brought back to mind a story by Margaret Atwood that was written in the 70s, Rape Fantasies is the name of it. And when I was first telling Emily about it, I remembered it as being an essay, but it's actually a short story. And it's a bunch of women who are sitting in a break room at work. And what kind of kicks things off is all of these magazine articles about rape, like, you know, like 10 ways to avoid it. And just those magazines of the 70s and 80s. So that prompts this whole conversation. So talking about these rape fantasies, and it's kind of like darkly comedic at times, but she's really trying to make this point that you're not talking about rape itself. She says, listen, I said, those aren't rape fantasies. I mean, you aren't getting raped. It's just some guy you haven't met formally who happens to be more attractive, dot, dot, dot. Rape is when they've got a knife or something and you don't want to. Hmm. Because the women are talking like, oh, well, yeah, you know, some guy swings down onto my balcony and comes in and we have sex or another woman's in the bathtub and she thinks about somebody crawling through the window and talking about like Roxanne Gay writing about rape culture. And to say that we even live in a rape culture is just horrific. But if there are things called rape fantasies, where did those come from? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like internalized desire, possibly. I don't know enough. I'm not a psychiatrist to study these things. And I don't want to shame anybody for any like sexual fantasies that they have. That's not the point. The point being, though, just that Margaret Atwood in the 70s was already talking about this issue of rape fantasies. Yeah. Hmm. So interesting. Yeah. This story, I found it free online at a couple different places, PDF versions, if you want to check it out, Margaret Atwood. Hmm. I finished a book called The Collected Regrets of Clover by Mickey Brammer. This does not come out until May 9th. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> it's a debut novel. Clover is a character who wrote her master's thesis on thanatology, which is the scientific discipline that examines death from multiple perspectives. She's very fascinated by death because she was exposed to it very early on. The very opening scene of this book, she's in elementary school early, like first grade, and her teacher who's reading them a picture book dies while reading the picture book. Oh. And she's one of those kids that's not afraid. She sits with the teacher and then she has other instances of death early in her life of people that are important to her. So she becomes a death doula. And when I read about this novel, I was really fascinated because one of the last things I did for a foundation I worked for was working in end of life issues. And we were funding specifically things like advanced care directives and things like that. And death doulas were one of the things we talked about potentially funding because that's gaining in popularity as our population, at least in the United States, is aging and is in need of more help. And a death doula typically comes in just at the end of someone's life and sits with them. They don't do the care taking that a nurse or somebody like that might do, but they just sit with them, sometimes help them talk through regrets or things they might want to be communicating to their family that they're having a hard time with. So in this novel, Clover is a death doula, and she's taking care of different people in her life, but her own life is very closed and lonely. Mm. What she does for, quote, fun is she goes to these things called death cafes which are, I pictured them as I was reading them, almost like an Overeaters Anonymous or AA meeting, you know, like people sit around in a circle. And in this case, they talk about death. Mm -hmm. And they might talk about their fears or their experiences. So she meets a man named Sebastian at one of these death cafes. And he wants her to work with his grandmother, who's very near death. And so Clover meets his grandmother, Claudia, who was this really interesting woman photographer. And they develop a very special relationship, even though, you know, you know, it's not going to last long. <laughs> you know, So that's the basis of the novel. And then other characters come in to play. There's a very cute 
scenes in a bookstore because there's a bookstore that's very meaningful to Clover that she used to visit with her grandfather. I really enjoyed this book. It's a debut. I was very impressed with her writing. The themes of it are obviously death, loneliness, love, regrets, which a lot of us have throughout our life, but particularly on our deathbeds, friendship, books, art, and kind of looking back at your life at the end of your life, but then also juxtaposed with someone who's still very much in her life. You know, Clover's not old. I think she's in her late 20s or early 30s, but she's kind of acts like it in certain ways, you know? Mm -hmm. So the book is her kind of coming into her own in her adulthood as well. Well, I've heard of death doulas before, but not death cafes. Are they... Do they exist? Do... I think so. You know, it's an interesting question. I didn't do any research. Mm -hmm. She talks about them as if they do. And one of them is even in the inner sanctum of the New York Public Library, the main <laughs> branch of the library. So I thought about when we went to that event with Susan Orlean down in the bottom, mm -hmm. like this beautiful theater that who knew existed right. down below. And she talks about she goes to certain ones because they have good food. <laughs> <laughs> that they offer. So I think they do. Oh. I mean, I know grief groups do, right? Mm -hmm. So this is similar in nature to that. But I think it is particularly for people to deal with some of their fears around death. Mm -hmm. I am so curious about that because I, it's not that I enjoy talking about death, but I think it's something that's so important to talk about as humans because we're all going to face it. Everybody wants to think they're going to live to a ripe old age and they're just die in their sleep eventually. But that doesn't happen for a lot, a lot of people. And I think it's just healthy to talk about it. Yeah, not only that, but just people do die every day. And there's just things that have to happen, literally like nuts and bolts things. And my biggest takeaway from that work I did was that a lot of people don't have things in place that they need to have in place because they simply don't want to have the conversations. And a lot of what we funded were people who were doing work with holding conversations, mm -hmm. which is in some ways what these death cafes are. And also just even putting someone like a death doula in the mix, people might be able to talk openly to that person in a way that like in this book, Claudia's children didn't necessarily want to hear what she had to say because then they have to face the fact that of reality. Someday she's not going to be here to be saying it anymore, right? So mm -hmm. it's almost that magical thinking, like if we don't have the conversation, it's not going to happen. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So having conversations with your loved ones can actually make the whole process much easier, even if it's not going to happen for 50 years. Right. Yeah. 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 I know some people who make plans for death too, and it doesn't happen. You know, I've known couples who think the man's going to die first, and then the other person dies first. And they're not prepared, you know, mm -hmm. because it's not the story they wrote in their head. You right. Know? Yeah. And it's just so important mm -hmm. because it is inevitable. Yep. Yeah. And I know. Yeah. I always said when I was doing this work, I would say, you know, some people say if I die, <laughs> it's like, mm, that's the one thing in my life I'm pretty certain it's going to happen. <laughs> right. We don't know the when or the how, but we know it's going to happen. Yeah. But it's a scary topic to talk about. I say that very flippantly, and I know that it's serious, you know. Oh, it totally is. But I think you and I, we both have had loved ones who've passed and been in different situations like that. So the mystery isn't there for us or, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And I, because yeah. I think for some people, you know, I have friends who are approaching 70 who still have parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So some people are well into middle age before they have a loss. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's such a shocking thing to think about. Yeah. 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 So again, it's called The Collected Regrets of Clover. Thank you to St. Martin's Press for my early copy. And this comes out on May 9th. And I will remind you about that when it does, because yeah. this is one I want people reading. Yeah. Do you think it would be a good book club book? Oh, I do. Yeah. yeah. I think you they would give you a lot to talk about. Because there's also happy. I mean, it's not this dark, terrible book. And that's what I loved about it is that even this woman, Claudia, who's this, she had this bright life, even though it had some regrets and some things that didn't go the way she wanted. In other words, she was living life. At the end, she still has wisdom to share. And here's Clover, who's there and ready to take it, the wisdom, and then it affects in her own life in positive ways. I think that's really beautiful. Yeah.
So yeah, I think it would give you a lot to talk about. Yeah. Well, good. I'm so glad you read that. I look forward to, to checking that one out. Yeah, really good. Did you read anything else? I read one other. Oh, tell me. I finished Maggie Smith's book, You Could Make This Place Beautiful. Another one that's not out yet. I'm sorry, April 11th. I will remind you of this. This is her memoir. Maggie Smith is well known as a poet. Her poem, Good Bones, which I have read on the podcast, went viral. And the title of this, You Could Make This Place Beautiful, is the last sentence of that poem. Mm. That's where this comes from. Oh my gosh, did I love this book. Maggie went through a really hard divorce and she has two young children. She lives in Bexley, Ohio, which is right down the street from where I used to live and was born and raised. It is a memoir, but it's similar to her book of essays called Keep Moving, where there's a theme to it. She circles back to certain things as poets are wont to do. And so one of the questions she's asking is she has the statement that says, a friend says every book begins with an unanswerable question. Then what is mine? And that changes as her memoir progresses. And she covers a lot of territory here. I mean, just the devolution of her marriage, if nothing else, but also choosing to be an artist and how hard that is to say, I'm going to really put my art ahead of some other things and try to make it my career. And how her husband treated her art in quotations. He would say, your work and do the air quote thing. So painful, right? Yes, yes. Oh my gosh. And also just a lot of honesty. Like when that poem went viral, that was actually really hard for her. Someone who might be an aspiring writer, you think, oh my God, isn't that amazing? But she wasn't ready for it. It started to create a lot of pressure in her marriage because her husband was kind of jealous and didn't know how to handle that. And then she had to figure out how to handle fame, essentially, and her work getting a lot of respect and interest. Mm -hmm. And she also said that poem has become, she knows something bad has happened in the world. If all of a sudden her social media feeds start filling up with people being interested in in reading that poem, you know, Mm -hmm. which is like, on the one hand, it's like, oh, good, I'm providing some people with comfort. But on the other hand, oh no, what happened? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to just say a couple things. The epigraph of the book is from an Emily Dickinson poem, which I loved and is going to have a little synchronicity with what we're talking about in Biblio Adventures. And it says, I am out with lanterns looking for myself. And that theme of being out with a lantern, she really carries through this whole memoir. And then the other synchronicity for me was with that other novel that I read, Take What You Need, there's a little piece of a Louise Bourgeois piece of writing, which is memory itself is a kind of architecture, which I just love the idea of that as this being a memoir and her trying to, you know, build how all of this came to be, you know, how falling in love with this man and the love of your life and being young and then eventually the marriage, you know, falling apart. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was incredibly well written. I loved it. Highly recommend it. And I also just wanted to do a shout out to our listener, Susan, who after I read the epigraph of Idra Novi's book, she said, oh, it was so nice to hear you mention Louise Bourgeois. When I was in grad school back in the day, I went to see her exhibit in New York City. And so it's like, oh, my God, three times now I've heard um, her name. And I just I really didn't know anything about her. So I want to look for some books about her or some of her writing. Oh, that's Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So again, you could make this place beautiful. Maggie Smith's new memoir out April 11th. Well, a Biblio Adventures. We had a huge one together yesterday. Do we want to talk about that first? Sure. We drove up to Amherst, Massachusetts, to visit the Emily Dickinson Home and Museum. They had a big renovation over COVID during the pandemic and just opened again recently. And we were so excited to get up there. Yeah, it was a really fun day. It was kind of cold and rainy. And somehow that made the house just feel even more atmospheric to me. I just loved that part of it. But also, I mean... I feel like our tour guide, Jill, was a little sad that the sun wasn't streaming through the windows because I'm sure it makes the wallpaper shine and the carpets glow. But I felt like it was really colorful and beautiful, even on a dark day. Yeah, it was a nice day to be inside. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Um, 
And so a lot has changed. You know, they've changed the flow of the tour. They've moved their offices as well. They now have their offices in a different building down the street. So when you first come in, you pay your entry. There's a little gift shop area. And then they have the poetry lounge, which has a lovely big dining room table there and a couch that we took a picture on, a mid 19th century looking couch where they have a bookshelf full of Emily Dickinson's poetry translated into dozens of different languages, which was so cool to see. Yeah, that was really cool. They had Thai, German, Russian, you name it. Yeah, yeah. a lot of different languages. And so that's where people can hang out and wait for their tour to begin. They welcome you to sit down. You can browse the books, which is nice, you know, because there's usually not a lot of places to sit in an author home museum. So we didn't have too long of a wait because we got there a little bit earlier and we browsed the gift shop, which is nice. So now post pandemic, one of the things is that they do sell tickets ahead of time, the time tours is what they are. And I know on the weekends, Jill said they've been really sold out and packed. So they haven't had a lot of uh, availability for walk-ins. They do still take walk-ins if the tours haven't sold out. Right, because due to COVID, the tours are also smaller in size. Yeah. And we were masked. They were, are very careful still about COVID protocols. Yeah. So, yeah, so they're limited to eight people, I believe. You can also talk with them if you have a group of friends that want to get together to do it. So, yeah, Jill was our tour guide, and she was fantastic. A hundred percent. Yeah, and we got lucky because... There were cancellations because it wasn't a nice day. So it was just the two of us and Jill. Yeah, it was really great. And so they have the house set up to be interpreted from 1854, I believe she said, right? Mm -hmm. So pre-Civil War and new carpeting, new wallpaper that's historically accurate. The vinyl floor in the hallway, the foyer when you first come in was really, I, I was so surprised that it was linoleum. And Jill said that back in the day, they used to take canvas, right, mm -hmm. and put layers of oil over it. So it would be oil cloth. They had a pattern that looked like a carpet, mm -hmm. but it would be easy to wash as people come in and out with their snow or dirty boots. Right, because the road was dirt. So right. they carried in a lot of dirt. Yeah. <laughs> but then other rooms had carpets. Or mats. I think they're mats up in Emily's room. Mm -hmm. So it was really kind of funny for me to be there anyway, because if I was talking to Jill, it would be Emily, Emily Dickinson, or my Emily. Right. And then he thought, oh, God, she's going to think we're a couple or something. <laughs> Not that that's problematic, but it's just like... We huh? are. We're just, a, we're just the book cougars couple. Right? Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Jill was so informative. She's actually an author herself and an English professor, and grew up in the area and returned after being gone teaching somewhere else. So her enthusiasm and passion was just palpable. Yeah. And she recited some Emily Dickinson poetry. She played the piano, a song that Emily would have played. That was really fun. I liked that part a lot. Yeah, that was really neat. And she told us that in the 19th century, Women, American women, if they played piano, they traditionally didn't play like the classic composers like women in Europe would have. They played ditties. Right. And, you know, <laughs> maybe hymns, I guess, too. Mm -hmm. So that was surprising. And it was fun to hear her play the piano there. Yeah. And so we walked from room to room. She closed the door in between so as not to interfere with other tours going on at the same time. I think they start every half an hour, so they're kind of crossing paths as they go. There was one thing that I did remember from last time, which there was a room where they had kind of, um, I don't know, what, how would you describe it, Chris, where you can see how her poetry is designed and they really break it down and deconstruct it. It was in what they think would have been Lavinia's bedroom, Emily's sister. So just across the hall from her bedroom. It's like this really wonderful, unique, interactive display with a poem of Emily's on it. It's like a wooden thing that hangs on the wall. But you can slide different areas to have different words appear in the poem because she had variants right. sometimes. Like So if you look at her manuscripts or a book that is a facsimile, you can see that there might be like a plus sign. And then if you look down at the end of the poem, there's another word there for that word. Then on another wall, they have a poem 
just written there in large font so you can read it from across the room. And I think the word was gambrels instead of gables. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and I didn't know what a gambrel was. And Jill explained that it's a roof line. Gables are just kind of pointed and a gambrel kind of slopes down, but not all the way. And then there's wall. Right. So there's a lot more space. So you can kind of see like how that really changes the intention of the poem or the image that's trying to be built in the reader's mind right. about space. Yeah. So fascinating. Thinking about Emily, who was writing all of this from a small little bedroom across the hall. Yeah. 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 And she always wrote in pencil. The reason was because of an eye condition she had. The eye doctor told her to write using pencil. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'd ever heard that story before. Yeah. The other thing that was in the house that were little pieces of furniture or pens or hats yes. that are from the Emily Dickinson Apple TV show. Yeah, they donated after they wrapped up filming. The creator talked to the director of the Emily Dickinson home and said, you know, come and look at the warehouse and take whatever you want that you think would be helpful because most of the items in the home are from the Dickinson family. But some of these items that were created for the show are historically accurate, period accurate. And so like the beaver hat that they have on display there would have been one like Dickens father and brother would have worn. Right. That you see in some of the pictures and things like that. Yeah. So it was a great time. They really did a great job with the renovation. They have more plans. They're going to build a replica of the carriage house that would have been there back in the day. And they're going to actually move the gift shop there and have the tour start there in the future so that they can then renovate what would have been the kitchen, which is where the gift shop is now, which, of course, I'm very interested in. And then Evergreen is the house just across the lawn where Emily's brother, Austin, and his wife, Sue, lived and their children. And that's in the process of being renovated. And I think they said it will reopen in 24. Is that what they I said? Don't, I don't know. I didn't yeah. catch that. And when we were there, they were excited because a, a woman that's a wallpaper conservationist was there looking at the wallpaper and trying to shore things up a little bit because yeah. they said the biggest threat to that house right now is just water damage and weather. So, yeah. 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 I had been in that house years ago. The first time I went up shortly after we moved here, so like 10 years ago, and it was a very limited tour. You walked in, I think you saw the living room, and then you went back into the kitchen but you couldn't go anywhere else. And they said it wasn't really safe at yeah. that point. There's a lot of personal items mm -hmm. in there. And that's one thing that's really interesting to think about with these author homes. Every item is an artifact for that museum curator to keep track of. Yeah. And I mean, Emily Dickinson's desk, her bed is very, very cool. Yeah. They have the model with her form with one of her white dresses and it was really funny because the other day, whoever does their social media posted a thing about her white dress and how it was the equivalent of hanging out at home in your sweatpants and T-shirts. And I thought that's <laughs> perfect. So funny. Yeah. Yeah. She wasn't wearing a bunch of petticoats. No. <laughs> After that, we went down the street to have lunch. And then we went to the Amherst bookstore and did a little browse. Yeah, we did. Um, <laughs> we found a couple treasures. I bought a book there that I'd never heard about before. It's by Charles Brockton Brown. And I'm familiar with his gothic romances that he had published. But I didn't know that he wrote a tract about women's rights. Alcuin is the title of this book, A Fierce and Elegant Plea for the Rights of Women. And on the back, it explains that he published this in two different pieces. So the first uh, piece was published in 1798, and the second half wasn't published until after he died in 1815. So this is the first time, and this is a 1970 edition, uh, that the two were brought together. And it's a pretty slim book. It is oh, just over 100 pages. But I look forward to reading that because I, I do like his novels. Awesome. Yeah. They have a really nice used section in the basement, and then upstairs is new. So we spent most of our time in the used section. And then we were able to walk down the street to our evening event of the pop opera, Emily and Sue. Yeah, that was really 
interesting. Um, <laughs> the composer, Dana Kaufman, was kind of there. The poor thing had COVID. Oh, so yeah. she was like around the block <laughs> in a place quarantining herself. So she zoomed in. And the director was also there. They're both Amherst alum, which I thought was interesting. Kaufman is a composer, and she'd always wanted to do something with Emily Dickinson. And somebody had contacted her that there was this grant available, looking for people to create things to celebrate this big anniversary that was happening in town about Amherst history. And so that was her opportunity to jump in and propose something that she's always wanted to do. And so this papara is about Emily and Sue's relationship. Emily kind of pining for Sue on the eve of Sue's wedding to Emily's brother, Austin. Right. And it all takes place. They actually did film it in Emily's room at the Emily Dickinson house, which was interesting. We had just literally been in there and then we were in this theater watching this beautiful opera singer sing pieces of Emily's poems that they put together into an opera. Right. Yeah. And her poems and some of their letters, maybe. And the description said that it explores themes of isolation, queerness, and forbidden love. And for me, like what really came through was just the isolation of heartbreak. Mm -hmm. It was so intense in yeah. that regard. But it was weird for me. I like opera and I like acapella, but the two of them together was really strange. And then they did beatboxing. Right. <laughs> so it was this really interesting old clashing with new. And I'm not quite sure what they were trying to do with that. And then there was the question, too, of like, what story are they trying to tell? Are they trying to tell the story that they actually had a relationship and I don't really feel like that is what they were trying to tell. I mean, in my opinion, that's not mm -hmm. what came across. It was more Emily sitting in her room, looking out the window, and out that particular window she was looking is where Sue lived and would be living for years to come and, you know, how she felt about her and loving her. But yet Sue was making a decision that the director pointed out they couldn't make a different decision at that time. I don't know if that's really true. Yeah, I mean, financially, it would have been hard for two women mm -hmm. of their class because women of their class didn't work. Mm -hmm. So financially, they were really, in a lot of ways, dependent on men. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he talked about that, like they couldn't make a different choice, maybe even internalized. Right. They may not have been able to. And Sue doesn't appear in this. The only actor that you see is the opera singer. And Sue is outside of her door, outside of Emily's bedroom door, and there's a knock. And, you know, Sue is asking her to come and see her. It's the morning of her wedding. And, of course, you know, Emily's upset. So yeah. Sue is kind of a tease, actually, is what the composer, I believe, said, that she almost seems like a siren voice taunting her, trying to get her to come when she, I think it was the director then who said Emily makes the choice for, for her own dignity. Right. So we don't want to give any spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> it was different. Yeah, very different. And the woman who plays Emily Dickinson, who sings the part, is African-American, which was a surprise for me. Mm -hmm. And she had really long, wonderfully done fingernails. So it was kind of like, this is so interesting. Like, we were just at the Emily Dickinson house talking about her digging in her garden and then to see these long fingernails, it was kind of like, that's an interesting clash mm -hmm. for me. Which I think, and I feel like they were trying to put you in today, mm -hmm. you know, with the beatboxing and all of that. But I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And the composer definitely made it clear that this is going to be performed in lots of different ways and has the ability to be put on stage and will be staged in the future. So part of what was hard about it for me was it had been a long day. We were a little tired and there was no movement really at all. Right. It was her sitting in a chair. I mean, she got up a couple of times, mm -hmm. but it was her sitting in a chair in a room. And I always find even those productions of plays tricky when there's like one scene. Right. On the stage. Yeah, like she moves like six feet, yeah. you know. And the music itself, too, there wasn't a lot of up and down. Mm -hmm. Like, so I'm used to opera where you have the peaks and the valleys. Mm -hmm. And this was just kind of like steady, I felt. So I kept waiting for something to happen. Yeah. 
and it was then, very repetitive. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, and that's when I realized, like, oh, this is about her heartbreak. Really, mm-hmm. this is what it, for yeah. me. I'm yeah. so glad we went. It was definitely a different experience. Yeah. Going back in time, I wanted to just recap a few things I did in Colorado. When I was visiting my son, I got to go to both the Basalt and the Carbondale Public Libraries. I now am a proud library card owner for both. The Carbondale Public Library, it was kind of cool because you could pick your library card, like the design on your library oh, card. so cool. I was pretty excited about that. It doesn't take much to get me excited. What did you pick? A beach scene, of course, nice. even though I was in the mountains <laughs> high up with no water. <laughs> They both have very cool friends of the public library rooms with books for sale all the time. Where we are here, Guilford has a little shelf when you first walk in, but they're big library sales you kind of look forward to. But these were pretty big, and I remember shopping in the basalt one the last time I was here. And I did find for my son Jacob a copy of Richard Powers' book, The Echo Maker, which I'm going to put a big plug in for that. That was published a long time ago, but it was my introduction to Richard Powers, who won the Pulitzer for the Overstory. Love that book. If you are a Richard Powers fan, look that one up if you haven't read it. And then I also went to White River Books, which is a beautiful little indie bookstore in downtown Carbondale. And they had a giving tree there, which I had never seen at a bookstore. I've always used to participate in the giving tree at the library in Yellow Springs. Ironically, families reach out to the library and request things that they need for their family. I don't remember in all the years I did it, anyone ever asking for books, which is kind of interesting. It was usually more staples yeah. like of living. Yeah, or you know, yeah. toys, pajamas, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. But this was purely kids and book requests. So I picked a nine-year-old girl who liked things about real life and adventure. And I had such a good time shopping in the bookstore for two books for her. That's cool. Yeah. And then for me, I picked up a copy of How to Love the World, Poems of Gratitude and Hope, edited by James Cruz with a foreword by Ross Gay. Just this beautiful little book that I'm just going to leave out actually on my nightstand and just read a little bit every day. And it's got a ton of different contributors so it's i'll report cover. back yeah it just it's a book that just feels good mm-hmm. <laughs> you know it's got like this beautiful paper cover and then on my way home i'm in the middle still of a couch biblio adventure of from scratch the netflix series based on the novel of the same name by tembi Locke, and the person next to me was watching it <laughs> Oh my God, Chris, it was so painful. I was like, don't look, look, don't look, look, don't look, look. (laughs) Because I could tell she was just like, I'm just going to watch this whole thing on this flight. You know, I think at the time I'd only gotten through three of the, I don't know how many, eight or 10 episodes. So that was really funny. It was really a practice in like, put your blinders on, do not look to your left. That's funny. (laughs) But I am really enjoying the series. I, of course, always recommend reading the book first, but it's beautifully filmed and some of it's in Italy and Sicily and then back in LA and lots of beautiful food and beautiful people and scenery so nice. yeah yeah well I had a couch biblio adventure recently there's a new adaptation of Charles Dickens a Christmas Carol or take on it I should say and that is spirited starring Will Ferrell Ryan Reynolds and Octavia Spencer and this is on Apple TV it's so challenging right now to to watch things and where is it and so much for saving money on cable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Spirited was a lot of fun. We watched it, I think, over Thanksgiving weekend. I love Ryan Reynolds. I think his comedic timing is just so amazing. And so I totally recommend it if people are looking for a good holiday film. And is it family friendly? I believe so. Okay. Yes. I was just, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but you know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. I mean, they go back in time to Charles Dickens' actual time, too. I don't want to give any spoilers. It's a musical, too, I should say, um, which makes me happy. Mm -hmm. Some of the songs, just spectacular, I thought, in terms of current events and things going on in the world. Mm. Really wonderful. And then the one that is set during Charles Dickens' time... It's kind of set on the premise that saying good day 
was kind of like F you back then. <laughs> That's funny. And I can see, totally see Will Ferrell yeah. taking that one on. So good day. And he says, and, and people are like, oh, I can't believe you said that to a child, you know? And so then they break out into song about that. So I thought that was a nice touch, but good film. Y'all, we're going to skip upcoming jaunts and go right to upcoming reads because we've got still our holiday gifts to talk about and an interview. We do, yeah. So just really quickly, I wanted to remind everyone, I know Louise Penny fans are aware, probably, but in case you're not, her latest Chief Inspector Gamache novel just came out. It's called A World of Curiosities. It has gotten starred reviews from Kirkus, Booklist, Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, and Book Page. Wow. Which is fantastic. And I also wanted to mention this because the TV show Three Pines, starring Alfred Molina as Gamache, is starting on December 2nd, which is the day after we're recording this. And it's going to be on Prime Video, for those of you who have Prime. According to Louise Penny, they're going to release two episodes a week for four weeks. And it's by the same producers who are doing The Crown. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I'm very curious. I know people will have very strong feelings about who's playing Inspector Gamache. I like him as an actor. I've only read the first book in the series, so I don't have an opinion. But Yeah, he makes me happy. Oh, good. He seems to be a good choice. Right yeah. on. So gift ideas for this year. Yes, the holidays are upon us. Whatever you celebrate, we wish you good cheer for this holiday season. And we, starting with our second episode of this podcast... We talked about gift ideas because the very first episode, hey, this is our anniversary, <laughs> it everybody. Is. It is. It's our sixth anniversary. <laughs> yeah. And so our first ever episode was December 6th. And so on our second episode, which was pretty close to the holiday, <laughs> we did holiday gift ideas. We're getting you a little bit earlier this year. So here we go with our 2022 gift ideas. Chris, go. Well, I was thinking it would be fun. And again, Louise Penny, right? She's been on my mind author merchandise. You know, a lot of authors sell merchandise from their websites or, you know, through a, another seller. Louise Penny's is through a bookstore called Brome Lakes Books, which is up there in Canada. I was looking around at things there, coffee cups, t-shirts, things like that could be a lot of fun. And we should say before y'all start to panic, we will put all of this in the show notes with links. Right. So you can just listen and relax. All of my gifts have a theme pairing. So my first one is my favorite cookbook of the year, Simply Julia, 110 Easy Recipes for Healthy Comfort Food by Julia Tertian. I love the cookbook. I highly recommend giving it as a gift. But she also has online on her website, Sundays with Julia, which are cooking classes every Sunday at two o'clock. And they come with recipes, a grocery list. It's over Zoom. You can participate at the time and or just get the recording. So I think that would be a really fun gift to give the cookbook and then give a cooking class with Julia or more than one. That's a great idea. And these are all gifts for yourself as well as loved yes. ones. Keep that in mind <laughs> because we should all be treating ourselves too. I was thinking about we're into Biblio Adventures here, as you all know. So author homes that could be in your area could be a really nice treat for someone to be exposed to a new author, a new time period, or a favorite author if somebody happened to live close enough. And then doing the pairing thing like Emily's talking about, you can get them a copy of the author's book, DVD if there's a TV adaptation, if you still do DVDs. Emily and I were laughing earlier about <laughs> VHS. Um, <laughs> So something like that could be a lot of fun in a nice outing or maybe even an overnight trip if you could swing it. Yes. One of the other things we've talked about is book gift subscriptions. There are a lot of them out there. When I was at the Bookworm of Edwards on my way up the mountain um, in Colorado, they have a book subscription they call, trust me, you'll love it. <laughs> you can get it in 12, six or three months. And then there's a different price for shipping versus picking up. Okay. But I think it'd be fun to give a subscription like that and then pair it with reading along. Mm. Like when you get your book, let me know what it is and I'll go to the library and get a copy or I'll buy a copy and we can read it together. Right. But let someone else do the heavy lifting of choosing. 
usually with these book subscriptions, if they aren't thematic, they have you do a little survey at the beginning so they know what kind of books to pick for you. Yeah, what you're interested, what you may have read already. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. I know I was looking at the one that Honest Dog Books has. They're up in northern Wisconsin. And it would be fun too. Like, I mean, if you can afford it, especially if somebody lives out of state, get it for them, get it for yourself. And then like Emily said, you can have your own little book club. Yeah. Over or, Zoom or compare something. and share the books you get. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and I was going to say a donation, you know, mm -hmm. financial help is always appreciated and needed by organizations too, that we always talk about, or we talk about fairly regularly is bank. It supports booksellers nationwide and comic book store sellers and then also every library, which helps support libraries in our country. Yeah, and I wanted to add diversebooks.org to our list this year, too. Their vision is a world in which all children can see themselves in the pages of a book. So they're very concerned with the publishing industry and making sure that diverse books are published. I think that'd be a good one to add to your list as well. And, you know, these are things, you know, I make my donations every year, but I have people on my list that they're like, I do not want a thing. And so I think giving them something like this, where you make a donation in their name is a really nice gift. Yes, it's so perfect. Yeah. indeed. If you want to make something yourself, a great idea could be to make a bookmark of, say, a book series. If somebody you know has a favorite book series that they're working through, list all the book titles in chronological order. Or if they have a favorite author, you could list all their titles in chronological order if they're working through it that way. And that could be a fun thing, you know, to make yourself, if you're on a tight budget or you want to do some crafty type work, that could be a lot of fun. And I thought about that because Laura's working her way through a series and she used to always say, what's the next one? And I'd look it up for her. And finally, you know, she's like, can you just type it up for me so I can just stick it on my door? So that's what I did there. And so I was thinking like, God, that'd be fun to just make, yeah, make a little thing. So That's easy to do idea. craft stuff is yep. put a little hole available. punch on the top and put a ribbon in it. Right. <laughs> get it laminated at the office supply store. If you want to get fancy. Yes, that's right. <laughs> you can actually buy your own lamination too. I used to have one oh, in Ohio. Mm, that's I cool. That oh, I had a job where we had a lamination machine. Oh my God. I laminated so many different things. <laughs> That's for another day. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about the Remarkable Life Deck, a 10-year plan for achieving your dreams. And this was something created by Debbie Millman. She's the host of the podcast Design Matters, which I feel like has been a podcast before there were podcasts, if that makes any sense, where she talks about creative people. And she's a creative person herself. And this is a really cool boxed set where there's a how to use this deck booklet and then there's a little journal and then there are these cards that help you to think about your life where it stands now and where you want to be 10 years from now and it's beautifully designed which is not a shock because that's what she does for a living literally lettering and designing of things and I think this would be fun to work through with somebody hmm. or as you were saying buy one for yourself and buy it for a friend the first of the year for me is always a time to look at stuff like this and have a little project. So that's what I plan to do with it. And I know some people I'm going to give it to. Nice. Again, it's called The Remarkable Life Deck, A 10-Year Plan for Achieving Your Dreams by Debbie Millman. And reminder, we will put links in the show notes with all of these things. Well, another thing you could do for yourself or by yourself, I should say, is record an audio book for a loved one or even a short story. Last episode, we talked about how Stephen King paid one of his sons to read him audiobooks on a cassette. You can do that now, probably on your smartphone. Most of them have an app where you can record MP3s. Very easy to do that way. That could be a lot of fun. Or you could give them a subscription to Libro.fm. They're doing a holiday promotion right now where they're doing credit bundles. They've changed this terminology. They used to call it gift memberships. And you can do them in giving two credit bundles, three, six, nine, 12, and 24. We will put a link in the show notes to this. If you use our link, we do get a little affiliate money from that, which we appreciate. 
We love Libro.fm. Reminder that we interviewed the people who are doing their podcast, and they do talk about what a great company it's to work for and the good that they're doing for independent bookstores. So it's also a great way to introduce people who aren't audiobook listeners but have a desire to be to the platform, and you could give them the gift of your time of showing them how to set it up and put it on their smartphone and all of that. Right. I mean, that is a great gift, too, to work with somebody who might be new to smartphones, is to just sit with them if you know how to operate them, and then just walk them through using different apps. Yep. That is priceless because once people learn how to use their smartphone or their iPad a little bit more thoroughly, they can watch videos, play games, listen to podcasts, yep. read books. It's <laughs> such an amazing device, and I know a lot of people are kind of intimidated by them. Yes, or just use them to make phone calls, and they do so much more. So the last thing I want to talk about are pairing of books. And in particular, I was thinking about giving Maggie Smith, who I talked about earlier, her book, Keep Moving, which is an essay collection. She also published a journal that goes side by side with that. Ross Gay, who I have on my list to be reading this year, he has the Book of Delights book, and then his new essay collection is Inciting Joy. That'd be a really nice little bundle. And then I've been reading a magazine called Cherry Bomb. And on the most recent, it's not one you can get a subscription to. They sell them individually. The most recent magazine in December has Erin French on the cover, and she's the author of the memoir Finding Freedom. I think that'd be a beautiful pairing as well. So think about books that might go well together, or as Chris was saying, a book and a DVD, or a book and a play, a movie or something like that, or sitting in front of the television, like give them from scratch and then sit in front of the television hand in hand and watch the television show. Right. Nice. The only other thing I have would be a signed edition or first edition, just be careful of that because not everybody cares about first edition or signed <laughs> edition. So if you're spending extra dough on something that you would value and, and they don't, you don't want to be heartbroken when you see them trash that first edition somehow. <laughs> yeah, but some people really are, or they have a very special book that to get a signed copy of is really lovely. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And that might be running a little bit late since it is December. So keep shipment in mind, too. I thought about that because Melinda Lowe, who we interviewed for this episode, signs books all over the place. And she has a list on her website of places that have signed copies. And I think the deadline for getting a personalized copy is going to be December 2nd, so after this episode goes live. But just keep that in mind, too. You know, go to author websites and see where they might have done some autographing lately. Mm -hmm. So I want to jump into talking about Melinda Lowe. She's a New York Times bestselling author of seven novels and numerous essays, which have appeared in anthologies and places like the New York Times, NPR, Autostraddle, and the Hornbook. Melinda's new release is A Scatter of Light, which Emily enjoyed. Her previous novel was Last Night at the Telegraph Club, which Chris and a whole lot of other people loved. It won a slew of awards, including the National Book Award, a Stonewall Book Award, the Asian slash Pacific American Award for Literature, and of course it was a New York Times bestseller. Prior to writing novels, Melinda worked as an entertainment reporter for outlets like AfterEllen.com. She has a fantastic website that is so well organized. She even has an archive that's really well organized by year. So, you know, if you're interested in her writing, if you're interested in YA books, LGBTQ, avoiding stereotypes in your own writing, she has so many great resources on her website. So check it out. We hope you enjoy our interview with Melinda. Melinda, could you give the listeners your version of a shelf talker for a scatter of light? Sure. A Scatter of Light is a coming-of-age novel. It's about an 18-year-old girl named Aria Tong West. It's the summer between high school and college, and she is sent to spend the summer with her grandmother, an artist named Joan West. 
and Joan lives in Marin County, California, just north of San Francisco. So when Aria arrives, she didn't really want to spend the summer there. She thought she was going to be doing something else, but her plans changed last minute. So she gets there and she expects to have kind of a boring summer. But the first day she's there, she meets her grandmother's gardener named Steph. And Aria realizes that she's attracted to Steph, which is something she had never considered before. She basically thought she was straight. So this is quite an eye opener for her. There's one problem. Steph is not single. So that sets up a summer of a lot of complications. The book is about coming of age, discovering that who you're going to be may not be the person you thought you were going to be. It's about family connections. It's about art and creativity. Yeah, it's about messy first love, I guess. (laughs) I just finished it this last weekend and I loved it. Oh, thank you. I wanted to talk to you about art. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, her grandmother is an artist, a pretty renowned artist. She also took artists under her wing. There's so many versions of art in this book. There's the sculpture that her grandmother does. There's painting, there's photography, and there's also music. There's so much music in this book which led me to ask, want to ask you the question, did you have a playlist you had as you were writing and or is music just a really big part of your life? (laughs) I did have a playlist, mostly of very sad, angsty love songs. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I did, I, you know, I don't write to music, but I listen to music to kind of get me in the mood for a book. And there are some songs that I absolutely connect with this book that I would listen to to get me in the right frame of mind. Music is, has been a big part of my life. My mother is a piano teacher and I had 11 years of piano lessons growing <laughs> up. I did not want to be a pianist, okay? <laughs> I wanted to be a writer since I was very young. So the piano lessons were not my favorite thing in life, but she is obviously a musician and my brother grew up playing like every single instrument and I've always loved listening to music. So certainly it was part of that. Yeah, it's a great list. I kept writing them down like Missy Elliott, Janelle Monet, <laughs> Rihanna, Nicki Minaj, MIA. I was like, wow, <laughs> this book is connected to music. <laughs> Circa 2013. Let's be clear now. This is 2013 music. Because <laughs> that's when the book is set. So. Yeah. We mentioned that we saw you at the Simmons University event we were streaming viewers of that event. And you talked about how this book, it's set in 2013, you wrote it back then, but it's just being published now. So it had a precarious route to publication. And we're wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So it is set in 2013, because that's when I started writing it. (laughs) It went on submission to publishers in 2014. At that time, it would have been my fifth book, but I couldn't get anyone to buy it. It went all around New York, young adult publishing. It was rejected by almost two dozen editors. And some of the rejections felt a little homophobic to me. The editors, some of them were clearly uncomfortable with the sexuality in the book. It was an extremely devastating experience, I have to say, to get these rejections. And so I went around looking for an editor who was not afraid of lesbian sexuality in a young adult novel. And I I did find him. And unfortunately, though, even he was not able to buy this book back then. We ended up working on a different book together called A Line in the Dark, which is a psychological thriller. And that came out in 2017. And by this time, I thought A Scatter of Light was dead. I thought I I would just shelve it in the back of my office and write it off as a failure. But then I had the idea to write Last Night at the Telegraph Club. And my editor wanted to buy that. And he also said at the time, I'd also like to buy a scatter of light. Mm. And I was totally shocked. You know, I tried to forget about it, (laughs) (laughs) but I I couldn't forget about it. And I, I still really wanted to work on it. So we agreed to do Telegraph Club first because at the time it was early 2017, the beginning of the Trump administration. It was a very difficult time. And even though Telegraph Club is set in the 1950s, we felt that it had some parallels to contemporary life and we wanted to do that book first. So kind of a slow writer. (laughs) It took me like three years to write it. 
So uh, but during that time, I kept thinking about a scatter of light and I realized that it was connected to Telegraph Club. So when I finished writing Telegraph Club, this is 2020, and I went back to revise A Scatter of Light, I could then bring those connections into the book. So A Scatter of Light is billed as a companion novel to Telegraph Club. It is set 60 years later, so it's definitely not like a direct sequel. Like, you're not going to see the same characters in it. But you will find out a little bit more about some of the people from Telegraph Club. And I'm so happy that it's able to be published now. You know, 2022 is very different than 2014 in YA publishing. There are many more queer YA books being published now than there were then. And the sexuality that some of those editors were afraid of has not changed. Uh, those scenes are almost identical to when they went on submission. So I'm, I'm really glad that the climate is friendlier to this book now. Let's talk about sex scenes. (laughs) 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 There's some hot sex in this book. Was it fun to write? Was it hard to write it? I mean, do you play certain music before you write those scenes? (laughs) That's so funny. No, I, you know, I, I don't have any difficulty writing sex scenes. I think they come very easily to me because I've joked about this before, but it is true. I like writing them because I like writing action. (laughs) So something is happening in a sex scene, right? There are things that people are doing and that gives me something to describe. So just like in the past, I've written fantasy, science fiction. um, I like writing fight scenes. I like writing, you know, murders. (laughs) I I like writing action-oriented scenes and Sex scenes totally fall in that category. I think that the scenes that I hate writing the most are like quiet conversations. Mm-hmm. I feel like that is where I am at my worst. I'm very bad at those. Mm, interesting. <laughs> yeah. To jump back to Last Night at the Telegraph Club, which is one of my favorite all-time novels. You know, it's, it's mm, thank you. Oh, it's not exactly a, a quiet conversation between two characters, but <laughs> when Lily is in bed. And she's looking at that photograph of the drag king. I don't think Mm -hmm. that's the terminology that's used back then. You know, the way you describe her, her, her pull towards this, I mean, it resonated so strongly with me. And I I could remember myself as a baby lesbian thinking like, (laughs) why am I so, you know, I didn't even think about why I was so drawn to my sixth grade teacher. I just was, and I asked her out to dinner, you know, so what what are you going to do? Um, Go you. (laughs) But I love that book so much. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about Lily's experience and how you kind of plotted that out or planned how to take her on that journey into self-discovery. Yeah, so Lily is a girl in San Francisco in 1954, right? So she has a different way of coming to understand who she is than Aria does in 2013, because in 1954, it's definitely not okay to be gay. (laughs) And there aren't any openly gay actors, really. There's very little media about gay people. So the way that Lily kind of puts the pieces together involves her finding things like that newspaper advertisement for the male impersonator or the drag king who performs at the Telegraph Club, seeing that photo and thinking, why do I like this? And she sees other photos as well in various publications and she kind of gathers them together. She's kind of like picking up these little clues in the world, but she doesn't know what the clues are telling her. It really takes her quite a while to figure out why she's interested in these people. And another thing she does is find some lesbian pulp fiction at a drugstore. You know, these were those really cheap bestsellers that were published with those really tacky covers (laughs) in the 1950s and 60s. They're iconic covers now, but I mean, they're kind of trashy. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So she she finds a lesbian pulp novel. She reads it. She's like, oh, my God. (laughs) You know, this is a very eye-opening experience. So it's really about coming to understand who she was through instinct, finding these clues that didn't really add up to something that she could say consciously, you know, but she has these feelings 
And she gradually comes to understand what they are because they're so strong in her and she can't really stop feeling them. Yeah. Yeah. So last night at the Telegraph Club, was that your first historical fiction? Yes. Yes, it was. And do you plan on writing more historical fiction or what's your favorite genre to write in? Because you've done fantasy and sci-fi, as you've said. I would love to write more historical fiction. I think that it really speaks to who I am as a person, which is a giant nerd. <laughs> like I really love to do historical research. I over-research everything I write, even if it's a fantasy story. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I've liked all of the genres that I've written in. I also read all sorts of different genres of books. So I think that the favorite is usually the one I'm working on right now. And currently, I have to warn you, I'm not working on anything. I haven't had time to write anything <laughs> in like a year and a half. So I'm really hoping to get back to writing soon. But sometimes whenever I write fantasy, that often feels very familiar, probably because that's the first thing I wrote. When I was a teen, I wrote three complete fantasy novels because I was a big nerd, <laughs> as I said. <laughs> I've written some fairy tale short stories over the years. Whenever I go back to that kind of fantasy voice, it does feel very familiar. So being a big nerd has paid off because you did win the National Book Award for last night at the Telegraph Club. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. And we want to... so shocking. <laughs> well, we want to know. Tell us about that experience. Like, what was it like to get the phone call? And just give us some background on the whole experience. Well, it was so. I knew that people liked Last Night at the Telegraph Club because before it was long listed for the National Book Award, it, it got eight starred reviews, which was a big deal. That doesn't happen very often. So I knew people liked it, but I had no idea actually that the National Book Awards started with a long list. What they do is they have a long list, then they call it down to a short list, and then they pick a winner. It's like a reality show. <laughs> and so I didn't know they would be announcing a long list. So the morning that happened, my editor called me and he was like, congratulations. And I was on the phone with him for like two minutes before I figured out what was happening because I had no idea what he was talking about. So that was a total surprise. <laughs> but then I did know that they were going to shorten it to a short list so I was completely nervous for the the next like two or three weeks between those and they called me the night before they announced the short list to tell me and I didn't hear my phone ring <laughs> <laughs> I, was just, I figured I wasn't gonna know I thought I would just find out on the day like on the internet mm -hmm. no they, they left me a voicemail <laughs> message so I saw the voicemail message like a couple hours after they left it and I was like, what is this really long message from New York? <laughs> <laughs> and I listened to it in my kitchen and I started screaming. I was so excited. I still have the voicemail message. Nice. I should really try to find a way to archive it, like put it on <laughs> something. I don't know. I, I listened to it several times <laughs> to make sure I did not hear it wrong. And uh, that was just an amazing experience. It was, it was really incredible. You know, they had a virtual ceremony last year. So it was a little sad. I couldn't go there in person, but it was also nice because I could go with my dog, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and my, my dog and my, my wife and I were all up here in front of my computer on the night of the event. And I was so nervous. I couldn't eat anything. So it's probably good. I didn't have to go to the real event because there's this very fancy dinner. Right. I, I would not have been able to eat a thing. I would have just been so nervous. Yeah. yeah. And then there's the whole walking up in front of people and, you know, delivering the speech. But yeah. you, you told us that you had some background in theater. So maybe that would have been your moment to shine. Who knows? Yeah. You know what? I think I would have been fine with that part. It's literally the waiting. Like you're in a river. If you've ever been an, a finalist for an award where they make you go to the, the place and sit there while they tell you who won. This has happened to me a couple of times. And it's so nerve wracking <laughs> like i really feel bad for the actors on oscar night like they're i mean you shouldn't feel bad for them they're like <laughs> extremely wealthy and successful but still you got to sit there and pretend like you're happy when you look right with a yeah. big camera in your face yes. yeah yeah yes. Yes. yeah so in a way it was also great because i was just here in my house and they didn't have the camera on my face i was preparing myself to not win 
and I didn't have to have any expression <laughs> on my face. Well, the power of Zoom too, you could have just had technical problems at the right moment <laughs> if you needed. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Melinda, you mentioned being up here. And for the listeners who can't see what you're talking about, Melinda has this great studio in her attic with wonderful bookshelves. And that's where her desk is. Is that also where you write? And can you talk a little bit about your writing process? Sure. Yes. I have, an, uh, I have a library in my attic. This is definitely where I write, although I haven't written in a long time, as I said. My writing process when I am writing is, you know, it changes depending on what stage of the process I'm in. But in the the drafting stage, like when I'm writing a first draft, I always do two things. I start with meditation. I meditate uh, daily anyway, but I always start with meditation. And then I turn off the internet. Mm. <laughs> so in the past, I used to use this thing called Freedom. Mm. It was an app that literally locked you out of the internet on your computer. I used that for many years and then I actually got better at this. So I didn't need to use that, but I usually write on an iPad. Now I have a laptop, but the iPad did not have any social media on it. So when I go back to writing, I'm not sure what I'm going to do about this laptop. I might have to reinstall freedom. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm rusty because I really think that social media is the number one destroyer mm -hmm. of creativity. It's just, I can't write when there's stuff pinging all over the place, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, Chris and I are both listening to Stephen King's on writing right now. Chris mm -hmm. has read it a couple times, but we're both listening to the audio. And at one point he says he also closes, you know, the shades on the windows in his office. And I thought, Oh, I don't know if I could do that, but it is, he must have a really distracting view. <laughs> well, I mean, it is distract, you know, if anything can distract you, if you're looking for distraction or procrastination. So I think that his point is, you know, you've got to just really focus on your work, but we have so many things that distract us now, our phones and yes. the internet. Kudos yes, to you. For sure. And then do you work for hours doing that? Or do you turn everything off for an hour and get to work? Or do you do a work day? Well, it varies. I have a goal when I'm first drafting to write a 1000 words a day. So sometimes it takes me half an hour, honestly. And then I stop. Sometimes it takes me eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I really try to stick to a 1000 words because on days where I feel really inspired and I just want to keep going, sometimes I do go on and I'll get, you know, 2000 words or something. But then almost without fail, the next day I cannot write. Mm. I really think that I can burn out. Mm. For some reason, a thousand words is kind of good. I can get it done. I can always get a thousand words down. That doesn't mean they're going to be the final words. And it doesn't mean they're good. <laughs> yeah. But when I'm first drafting, I always push forward because it's very important to get to the end because you cannot improve the book until you have written it the first time. So that's what I always tell writers, you know, you got to get to the end. It doesn't have to be good, <laughs> the first draft, and it probably won't be. But that's okay because once you have something to work with, you can then go back and shape it and refine it and make it into the thing that you imagine in your head. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So did that happen with a scatter of light? Because you, you said the sex scene stayed the same, but did the story change a lot from when you, you know, when someone said, okay, we have interest and we want to publish this. It did change because there were so many years between when I first wrote it. And when I started to revise it, I realized I needed to add an entire new storyline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So part of A Scatter of Light is about Aria. Aria wants to be an astronomer, like her grandfather. She's very interested in astronomy. She's never really been interested in making art. But during the course of this book, she starts to realize that she is interested in that. So that's a storyline that did not exist in the earlier draft. And I realized I needed to add this in. So that's one of the major things I did when I started revising it. I also had to move it geographically. <laughs> the earlier drafts, Aria was from Connecticut and she spent the summer in Colorado. So I grew up in Colorado and I kind of wanted to write a book set in the West. I thought that would be fun. And the problem is I haven't lived there since I was 18. 
I mean, I go visit, but I don't live there. So I don't really know the place. And I had this idea that once I sold it, I would do some research. You know, I would go back and like drive around and talk to people. And, um, but then the pandemic happened. And during the pandemic, I couldn't go there to do the research. And also I knew nothing about Connecticut. I have no <laughs> idea why I decided Aria was from Connecticut. It made absolutely no sense. So I decided to change it. And then Aria came from Massachusetts where I live now. And she spent the summer in Marin County where I used to live as an adult. And my wife was there with me. So the whole time I was revising it, I would check in with her. Her name is Amy. I'd be like, Amy, is this right? Do I remember this correctly? Is this how you get to Safeway? <laughs> I would like talk to her about it. So that was actually a big change as well. That was another part of the revision. So it, it changed quite a bit. But I think the core of the story and definitely Aria as a character is very close to who she was okay. at the beginning. Oh, so yeah. fit, interesting. Yeah. 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 I love that part of the story. Now, of course, I can't imagine it without that aspect of all of those things that you mentioned. So yeah. 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 They clearly needed to exist. Right. right? right. Yeah. So. We usually ask an author what they're working on, but since you said that you're not doing any writing, we don't want to put any pressure on you, but we want to ask you a question. Your books, the listeners can't see, but Melinda's books are both sitting behind us, A Scatter of Light and Last Night at the Telegraph Club. And the covers are so beautiful. Did you have anything to do with choosing the covers? The covers are both illustrated by an artist named Feifei Ruan. And she is a brilliant artist. She's done a lot of book covers, but she also does a lot of other art. She's a professional artist. She's great. The cover process is so interesting because I didn't really choose her. That was the art director at my publisher in, in working with my editor. They chose her and she had time to do it. But I was consulted on what should go on the cover all the way down to like what the characters should be wearing wow. <laughs> so that was really an interesting process which i had not been involved so closely before it was it was really wonderful to be involved with it for example on the cover of telegraph club there are all these chinese language signs and they are historically accurate Chinese language signs of places that existed in Chinatown in the 1950s. So I wanted to make sure that they, they were correct, you know, and so um, the characters read correctly. <laughs> that was really fun. Um, for a scatter of light, we had extensive, extensive discussions on what the truck should look like. Mm. There's a truck that has a big important part of the book and it's also on the cover and we had to make sure that it looked correct on the cover because it is a very key element of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Hmm. Chris wants to go home and start hmm. reading right now. <laughs> well, I can't wait. I'm, I'm saving it for the end of the semester. It's going to be my treat when uh, I turn in that final paper. So I can't wait. <laughs> oh, well, I hope you oh. like it. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, Melinda, this is great. Thank you so much for making the time to talk with us today. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again in two weeks with another episode. Until then, come chat with us on social media. If you'd like to become a Patreon supporter, we would love to have you join our community. All of the books that we talked about in this episode are listed in the show notes, which you can find at bookcougars.com. Each book will link to our bookshop.org page where your purchase will help support not only the book cougars, but also independent bookstores everywhere. And if you're an audiobook listener, we do have a special offer from libro.fm. You can find all of this information on our website. Again, that's bookcougars.com. Thanks, everybody. Wow. This episode is edited by Pat Keo Sound Design.